Okay, so we know what cells are. They're microscopic. They're the smallest independent unit of life. But since technology has improved over the years and microscopes have become more and more powerful, we've been able to look inside of cells and see the smaller structures within them that carry out particular functions. Those are called organelles, and that's what this video is about. It's about cell structure and function, and we're going to be looking at these things called organelles. Let's have a look. So before we do begin, this lesson's focusing on eukaryotic cells. This is a eukaryotic cell here. And in a previous video that I've made, I differentiate between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells. And we look at the similarities and differences. But this lesson focuses on eukaryotic cells because eukaryotic cells are the ones that contain these membrane bound organelles, which we're going to be looking at. So if you haven't checked out that video, eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells yet, I recommend you go and have a look first. So as I was saying, inside of the cell, we have these things called organelles. Here's a definition for you. Organelles are discrete structural bodies within cells that carry out specific functions. For an easy way to think of it, I want you to think of things like your eyes, your heart, your kidneys. They are discrete structural bodies within your body that carry out specific functions. Your eyes have a specific function. Your heart has a specific function and your kidneys have a specific function. They also have specific structures. Well, within the cell, there are specific structures that have specific functions, just like the organs in your body. That's how they get the name organelles. So you would have been hearing me use these terms, structure and function, they are critical terms in biology. And when we look at these main organelles in this video, I'm gonna be highlighting the structure of each of them and the function of each of them. If you're still a bit unsure about the differences between those terms, structure and function, check out the video on structure and function and that will help you to get your head around it. So we're gonna focus on six of the main organelles within eukaryotic cells. The first one we're going to look at is the nucleus. The nucleus is the most prominent organelle inside of a cell. It's, uh, it's really obvious, it's quite central, and it looks something like this. Its structural features, so things like what does it look like, what is it made of, it's got a nuclear envelope around the outside which has a double membrane, and it has these things called nuclear pores, which are little gaps in that nuclear envelope where things can move in and out. The main role of the nucleus is to house the genetic information of the cell, which is of course the DNA. And in this diagram, the DNA is in the form of what we call chromatin. You can't see the chromatin. It's not like when DNA is condensed into chromosomes. Let me just remind you, these are much bigger than what we've got in our diagram there, but these are human chromosomes. There's 23 human chromosomes. This is when the chromatin gets condensed and packed together when the cell is going to divide. But when the cell is not in the process of dividing, the DNA exists as chromatin, which is what we have here. So the DNA is housed inside of the nucleus. The nucleus also contains a section called the nucleolus. The nucleolus we don't focus on a lot, but is where ribosomal RNA is produced. So the function of the nucleus is that it is the control center for the cell. It controls all cell activities. And for that reason, I often get my students to remember the nucleus as though it is the brain of the cell. If you wanna make an analogy, you could think of it as the brain of the cell. Think of it 
as the brain of the cell, but don't describe it to someone as the brain of the cell because they'll be confused. What are you talking about? Cells don't have a brain. It's thought of as the brain of the cell because its function is to control cell activities. So when asked what the function of the nucleus is, the best answer you can give is that it controls cell activities. And the reason for that is because it contains the DNA or genetic information, which holds all of the information to help control cell activities. The plural term for nucleus is nuclei. The next organelle is called the mitochondrion. Here's a mitochondrion here, and here's a simpler diagram of a mitochondrion. The structural features of a mitochondrion are that it again has a double membrane. The outer membrane is quite simple. Notice that the organelle is sort of a long, thin sort of sausage shape. The inner membrane, however, has these folds, which are typical of a mitochondrion, and we call them cristae. So that's a giveaway for a mitochondrion. The inner membrane folds, which we call cristae. Uh, you'll also see inside here some mitochondrial DNA. Uh, and the, in the simpler diagram, you'll see the cristae is the giveaway that we're looking at a mitochondrion. So they're the structural features. The function of the mitochondrion is that it is the site of the latter stages of aerobic respiration. Aerobic respiration is where glucose is broken down to release a great deal of energy. So a way to remember the function of the mitochondrion is to think of it as the powerhouse of the cell. Again, please don't describe it as the powerhouse of the cell, just use that to remember it. And that's because it's involved in energy production in the latter stages of aerobic respiration. The plural for mitochondrion is mitochondria. So ending in I-A instead of I-O-N. Now many mitochondria are often found in areas of cells that need lots of energy. So for example, the sperm has lots of mitochondria located around the tail where it requires energy. Our next organelle is the chloroplast. The chloroplast is only found in plant cells. The chloroplast structural features are fairly complex. There's quite a few that are labeled in this diagram. It contains again a double membrane, the external membrane and an internal membrane. Inside of a chloroplast, you find these flattened membrane enclosed sacs called thylakoids. And the thylakoids are often stacked up and the stacks we call granum or the plural term for those is grana. Surrounding those grana are a, is a fluid called stroma. So basically, inside of our chloroplast, we've got grana, the stacks of thylakoid discs, and the stroma, the fluid surrounding it. Now, you'll notice the green color. That's very important because the thylakoid membrane contains pigments, and one of the key pigments is called chlorophyll, which is a green pigment that's very good at absorbing light, which is important because the function of the chloroplast is that it is the site of photosynthesis. And photosynthesis is the process where water and carbon dioxide are converted into glucose, that very important sugar molecule for energy, and that process is done using light energy. And chlorophyll inside of the chloroplast is the pigment that can absorb light energy. So it's because plant cells contain chloroplasts that they can carry out photosynthesis. And it's because animal cells do not contain chloroplasts that they can't carry out photosynthesis. Here's just another diagram here it's showing the same thing, but it's actually a photo micrograph. So this is an actual photo taken with a microscope. And you can see the stacks here. These are the grana. And then, of course, the fluid through the rest of that 
uh, organelle is the stroma. Again, you'll notice DNA inside of the chloroplast. DNA is inside of the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. And that actually is a really interesting piece of evidence for where chloroplasts and mitochondria are thought to have originated from. They're actually thought to have started out as bacterial cells. And there's more about that in a video about endosymbiosis. So check that one out if you're interested. This one's a very simple organelle. It's called the vacuole. I've got two cells here. I've got an animal cell and a plant cell. The structure of the vacuole is it's simply a large fluid filled space surrounded by a membrane. So very simple structure. The function of the vacuole, if I can fit this in, is storage of things like water and oil. It's also responsible for maintaining osmotic balance and cell shape. Now, you'll see that in the two different diagrams here, in animal cells, there's smaller vacuoles, and they don't always contain vacuoles. In plant cells, they have a large central vacuole, and that large central vacuole contains lots of water, and it's critical in maintaining the plant cell shape. Now, we also talked about osmotic balance, Osmosis, as we know, is to do with the movement of water. So that the vacuole containing water is critical in maintaining the balance of water movement within the cell. Second to last organelle here is the Golgi body, or often referred to as the Golgi apparatus. The structure of the Golgi body, as you can see, it just has these simple sort of membrane sacs and there's also these membrane enclosed little parcels called vesicles. That's their name there, vesicles. And they are really important because the Golgi body's function is packaging and secretion of things like proteins and carbohydrates that have been produced by the cell and are then being shipped off to leave the cell and they get shipped off inside of these things called vesicles. So the job of the Golgi body is to package these proteins and carbohydrates up into a vesicle and then send them off where the vesicle will bind with the cell membrane and release the products outside of the cell. That's called exocytosis, but there's more about that process in another video. So to help you remember the function of the Golgi body, I often tell my students to think of it as like the post office of the cell. Because what do you do at a post office? You package and send things away. And that's what happens in the Golgi body, that things get packaged up and sent away. Of course, that's how you're gonna remember it, but when you describe it, you're gonna say it's involved in packaging and secretion. I also get my students to remember the structure because I think it sort of looks like a Wi-Fi symbol. And you'll often see the Golgi body with that sort of shape. So that might help you to recognize a Golgi body when you see one. Okay, our final organelle is called the endoplasmic reticulum. But luckily, we just get lazy and refer to it as the ER. So we have two types of ER. We've got the rough ER and the smooth ER. And the only difference in structure between the rough ER and the smooth ER is that the rough ER contains ribosomes, giving it that rough appearance, and the smooth ER doesn't. The ER is a series of membranes that runs from the nuclear membrane all the way out to the cell membrane. So it's a continuous series of membranes that runs between the cell membrane and the nuclear membrane. Now, because of that, I just need to squeeze the function in here. Because it's a series of membranes that runs all the way between the nuclear membrane and the cell membrane, 
One of its functions is that it's involved in the transport of materials because things can move along that series of membranes. The unique functions for each is the rough ER, because it contains those ribosomes, it's involved in protein synthesis, because as you would have seen in my videos about translation, the second part of protein synthesis, that takes place at the ribosomes, so that can occur at the rough ER. And with the smooth ER, it's involved in lipid synthesis and also carbohydrate synthesis. So that's the difference between the two in terms of function. The difference between the two in structure is that one has ribosomes and one doesn't, and we call them the rough ER and the smooth ER. So there are six organelles. There's a lot of information to take in there. I really hope that it's helped. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you next time. Hold up.